Hello, my good friends. How are you doing today? BT5, episode 11 of Science. So, yes, let's get started today. I want to start off with a quick question. What do you, me, a sandwich, a rock, Pluto, and a blue whale? And let's just throw in Godzilla, just for fun. How about Godzilla, too? What, is, what do they all have in common? We're all actually made of the same thing. We're made up of these things called atoms. And atoms are extremely, extremely interesting, especially when you get into the crazy aspects of atoms, about how much they weigh, how much uh, empty space they are, and things like that, and what they're actually made of. They get crazy. So let's go over some of the cool facts about elements. I don't want to go too crazy with just talking about protons, and neutrons, and electrons. We can talk about those things for, for quite a while as well, but they're not quite as interesting. So I want to talk about more about the interesting aspects of elements and atoms so you guys don't get too too get get too sad with the little boring aspects of this episode. So first off, have you ever actually thought about what you're made up of? You're made up of about 40 elements. So there's there's about 90 naturally occurring elements, and then there's about 120 elements altogether. So we've made about 30 elements or so. Um, some people argue about 25, but most people agree about 30 elements have been made unnaturally. We put them in a we put these uh, big elements in a collider and then we collide them with neutrons until we can make something even bigger than what we have right now and that's how we make larger and larger elements the only real problem with those elements is that they basically disappear in microseconds or nanoseconds they just disappear almost instantaneously and usually we don't even see them we just know that they have had to have existed because some sort of particle flew off and we knew that it had to be attached to that uh, atom for just a little while so anyways let's talk about the basics really quick what are atoms made of? Well, they're actually made of these three little parts. They're made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And there's nothing too crazy or special about those guys besides that protons are positive, electrons are negative, neutrons are neutral. I think that's pretty easy, and you guys probably have heard of that quite a bit, but it is also very important to understand that, or at least know that. Just memorize it. So when you think about atoms altogether, when you think about atoms just around us right now, think about your desk, think about your mattress, think about your window, think about water, and think about even the gases in the air. You don't really think about gases being made up of matter or atoms, but if you just put your hand through the air, you realize there's some sort of resistance. The resistance is you're pushing all these atoms out of the way when you move your hand through the air, and that's what causes your, the little pressure on your hand is these atoms getting in the way. So atoms are everywhere. And you, as soon as you realize that atoms are everywhere, and even them being everywhere, it's crazy to think about how much empty space an atom actually is. When you look at the amount of empty space in an atom, it's kind of hard to explain it, but let's just put it this way. If you have a proton, that's about the size of a P, which of course protons are not that size, they're much, 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 much smaller, but let's scale it up. Let's make proton about the size of a P. To reach the first electron, the first electron, which, if you know atoms, the more electrons you get, the further out they get, usually they kind of get in these electron shells. But just to get from the proton to the first electron, you'd have to go about half of a mile. So can you imagine just running a half of a mile straight? It would take you, you know, four or five minutes, depending on how fast you are. If you're really fast, it could take you a couple minutes. But four or five minutes, depending on how fast you are, and if you're just taking an easy jog, to run down there... And you will not be able to see that P whatsoever because it's so unbelievably tiny by the time you get that far away. And all that space in between the proton and that electron out there is completely empty space. There's nothing there. So as soon as you realize that a w one atom is 99 point... Hold on, let me, let, me, let me say this nice and slow for you guys. 99.99999999999. Nine 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 percent empty space. That's ninety nine with point thirteen nines after that percent empty space. So I just think that that's ridiculous. That you think about a table when you knock on that wood, you think it's just completely solid. But there's just so much empty space in this guy. There's so much empty space in the in if you take a big chunk of lead or something like that. All that just empty space, and it's just kind of ridiculous to think about that. 
So let's talk about a, a couple cooler, cooler things, cooler aspects having to do with this. So about how much does an atom weigh? It's hard to tell you guys exactly how much an atom weighs because we actually just make up a unit because it makes it a lot easier for us. Yeah, we just magically made up a unit. It's called an atomic mass unit. So one proton weighs one atomic mass unit. One neutron weighs just a little bit more than one atomic mass unit. And then an electron weighs quite a bit less. An electron's really, really light. It's about one 1,836th atomic mass unit. Also, we don't even really know if an electron has takes up space. We think that electrons might actually be infinitesimally small. So that's just kind of ridiculous to think about right there, that an electron, even though it has charge and it has mass, is infinitely tiny. Kind of reminds me of a black hole, to be completely honest with you guys, but... That's what uh, people tend to think. Now, uh, that's not proven. It's not proven that an electron is infinitesimally small, but that seems to be the uh, common theory going on right now. So, how big are they? This is, like I said, really, really hard to comp to grasp. It's just hard to understand how small an atom is. So, if we scaled this guy up, like I said, if we scaled it to a P, you'd have to run half a mile just to see the first electron. Now, can you break up an atom into smaller pieces? Oh my goodness, you can. You can. Electro atoms are actually made up of smaller pieces than what we used to think was the most indivisible part of nature. The most indivisible part of the everything. We can actually break it up into these things called quarks. And it's not cork, not C-O-R-K, it's quark with a Q-U. Q-U-A-R-K, that's what a quark is. So, if we had to take a, a quark and we scaled the quark up to the size of a P... So just one quark up to the size of a P. By the way, a proton, if we scaled that up to a P, we'd have to run half a mile. If we scaled the quark up to the size of a P, how far would we have to run before we see the first electron? We'd have to run 500 miles. So that's 1,000 times the distance of a proton to reach the first electron. So roughly, a quark is 1,000th one the size of a proton. And that's just a rough estimate, not exact. So now, it's a good question to ask of... If you have a atom and the protons are of course positive, the electrons are of course negative, but you have all these protons that are in an atom and they're all really bundled together in the center. You have a big center part of the atom with a bunch of positive charges. What the heck keeps them from flying apart? If you guys know about magnets and stuff, positives don't like to be together. They like to positive, positive like to be next to negative, and they just get happy and just hug each other. But if you have a bunch of positives together, they're like, no, I don't want to get close to you. Screw you, and they try and fly away from each other. But for some reason, atoms just hold together. They have all these positives in the middle. What? Why? Why do they do that? There's actually some crazy thing called the strong nuclear force. And there's actually all these... Um, there's these things called gluons. And they basically glue everything together. These quarks interact with the gluons and the gluons just hold them together. And I just thought this was unbelievably interesting. I, I have to tell you guys this. It does not have that much to do with atoms. But if you had two quarks, and let's just pretend like we can pull them apart with our hands. We have one quark in our left hand, one quark in our, in our right hand, and we're slowly trying to pull them apart, and we're using a bunch of energy to pull them apart. And rah. Eventually, if we pulled them far enough away from each other, we'd use up so much energy that we could actually pop new quarks into existence. So basically what I'm trying to say is that if you ever pulled, um, is that these quarks really like to be together, and if you ever try and pull them so far apart where they're not close enough to to each other, you're making enough energy to actually pop quarks into existence. You're making matter out of energy. Just like E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Yeah, we just made so much energy that we made new matter. I just think that was a really cool aspect to that, that I had to throw it in there. So now, what type of quarks are atoms made up of. It's not really that important, but I'm going to tell you guys really fast, just in case you are interested. There's six types of uh, quarks that we normally think about, and then there's a couple other fermions and stuff that uh, make up uh, basically the rest of matter, or the rest of things that we usually think about. So a proton is actually made up of two up quarks and one down quark. This gets into more quantum mechanic -y things, and it's not quite as important for you guys to understand right now. Maybe I'll make another quantum mechanics video, even though that stuff's really hard for me to understand, and I might not be able to, 
to uh, explain that to the best of my ability. And then a neutron is made up of two down quarks and one up quark. So that really doesn't make that much of a difference, but also at the same time you're realizing that that makes the charge difference and the charge difference holding, holding atoms together and making them an actual atom is of course extremely important. So now how do we, I want to go over how we get different elements or what different elements are actually made up of. So hydrogen. We have hydrogen, the first element on the periodic table, and of course we're gonna, you're going to see a nice little picture right there. Hydrogen is made up of one proton and one electron. And then once you get to helium, all you're going to do is add one more proton and one more electron. So every single time you go up in a proton, you're going to go up in an element. And Adding one proton to these things makes it have totally different properties, and that's the cool thing. Sometimes when you go from helium down up to lithium, you can turn from a gas into maybe some sort of weird solid or something. Whoa, what is going on here? And then all of a sudden you go from neon, a gas, and then you go add one more, and you get potassium, the thing in bananas. Oh my goodness, what the heck is that? That guy's a solid. So you're just adding one proton, and you get totally, totally, completely different properties when you think about these things. And I think looking at the periodic table and realizing that you're just adding a proton, and you're getting a to totally new set of how that atom is going to react to other things, it just gets kind of ridiculous. So every single time you go up with one proton, you change what the element is. But at the same time, every time you get a proton, you usually get an electron as well. So you're going to get one proton and one electron every single time. Now, the one different thing about that is that sometimes you can share electrons and get rid of electrons and get positive charges and get negative charges and things like that on the atom itself. So electrons don't have to be there, but the proton is the most important thing to make it that element that it is. And then also, what about those new what about those neutrons? Do those matter at all? Actually, the neutrons do matter quite a bit. In fact, as you go higher in the periodic table, um, as you get heavier and heavier elements, you tend to get more neutrons than you do protons. So if you, for example, have a hydrogen, you have zero neutrons in that guy. If you go up to something like um, carbon or something, you probably have six, you have six protons and six neutrons. But then, once you get higher and higher, eventually, I don't know the exact numbers, but you'd get something like um, 43 protons, and then you'd get like 55 neutrons. And then eventually you get up to something like uranium, and I think you get, what is it, 92 protons and like 242 neutrons or something like that? Uh, don't quote me on that, but that's what I think. You get something ridiculous where there, it's like triple the number of neutrons than protons. So as you go higher and higher in the periodic table, you tend to get more and more neutrons. Also, is the higher you get up in the periodic table, the more unstable things get. Iron is the most, uh, the highest, most stable element that you can get. So you have iron, which is 26. That means every element above 26 is eventually going to decay down to absolutely nothing. In fact, it's going to decay down to iron. So everything's going to eventually turn into iron in the entire in the universe, unless they go into black holes or something like that. Or, well, I mean, just of course that makes sense with atoms everything will eventually turn into iron. But, um, let's continue on here. Um, also, why don't electrons just fly off into space? So you have an electron that's going about three-fourths the speed of light, moving around this big, this big chunk of uh, uh, protons and neutrons in the center there, but it's really, really far away. If you think about it, like I said, 99 point amount empty space, and you have these el these electrons just kind of floating around really, really fast. Why don't they just fly away? Well, there's actually the electromagnetic force. You got protons, which are positive. You got electrons, which are negative. And these electrons um, are attracted to the proton. So that's how you get those guys to not fly away. So earlier, th I said that you guys are made up of elements. And, of course, you're made up of some elements more than others. And oftentimes, these elements actually form compounds together with each other. So elements like to bond with certain things. For example, a, just a common one is sodium chloride. So if you look at the periodic table over here, you notice that uh, sodium is on the left side over there, all the way on the very left side. And that guy only has one valence electron. And if you don't know about valence electrons, that's okay. We're not really going to talk about them today. But what has one valence electron, so it wants to get full a full shell of eight electrons. 
So it's going to bond to something that it gets seven electrons. So you just always want to get eight electrons in the very outer shell. So you want to add them up together. You have one plus seven equals eight. Now, if you're just talking about other things, you want calcium to bond to like nitrogen or something, something like that. That would make a solid. That would make a. Uh, uh, stable compound, things like that. But of course, sodium chloride is one of the most common things. In fact, you probably have about one, half a pound of sodium chloride in your body right now, believe it or not. You might not believe you might have that much salt in you, but it is actually quite interesting. So, uh, in the grand theme of, in the grand scheme of things, how do atoms relate to the periodic table? Every single time you add a proton to an to an atom, you're going to probably get another electron and eventually get another el a higher up element. And that's really all I got for the periodic table. And one last quick thing, I know this is the longest video we've had so far. Hopefully you guys found it interesting. I know I just kept rambling on and on um, about some of these things, and I'm not a chemist, so uh, some of these things don't come exactly natural to me. But I wanted to talk about antimatter really fast. So is antimatter made up of atoms? Well, supposedly they have the same mass, but they have a reverse charge and spin, and uh, we don't really know what happens when antimatter atoms touch antimatter atoms. We think that they just can form some sort of compound or something like that as well, but when an atom and an anti-atom touch each other, they actually just annihilate into pure energy, and that's one way that we think in the future we might actually be making some sort of energy. If we take antimatter and we take matter and we put them together, we're just going to make intense amounts of energy. So that was pretty much all I have for atoms. Hopefully you guys found this somewhat interesting. Like I said, if I made any mistakes or anything, let me know, and I'll try and uh, remedy those with some annotations. Uh, thanks for watching, and have a great day.